Um, all right, so thanks for having me. Um, today I'm talking about Silicon, the Stanford Initiative on Language Inclusion and Conservation in Old and New Media, Bridging the Gap um, for Digitally Disadvantaged Languages. So imagine not being able to write your own name correctly on your phone. Imagine not being able to text your partner in your shared mother language. What if your grandma needed to send you a few things for your grocery list and she had to choose between doing it in a language she's not comfortable with or trying to render her best language using a different script or sending an audio file because the writing system she knows isn't usable in a digital environment. And then there's the matter of the digital interfaces and the software we use every day, from Microsoft Word to Instagram to the great assorted diversity of random mobile apps for everything from knitting to gaming. They all have interfaces that involve text and an English on the interface or an interface that supports English and a handful of other languages with large groups of wealthy speakers sends a clear message that um, your language has no place here, that it's not really part of the digital world, and that the power and wealth and cultural capital that come with being part of that world. So of the approximately 7,000 living human languages, all but 100, roughly 98%, are categorized as digitally disadvantaged languages, meaning their speaker communities encounter these scenarios that I've just described. These languages may not be able to be reliably and consistently written in digital environments, Maybe the issues of the letters can't be typed, or maybe there aren't fonts that have the right combinatorial logic programmed into them to display the text in a way that reads naturally. Maybe there aren't keyboard layouts that support the language, or maybe no one has trained an autocorrect model when fingers inevitably slip on tiny mobile displays. While the cultural impact of large language models still remains to be seen, and some will argue that a lack of large language models is a blessing for a language, even many languages with keyboards, fonts, and basic autocorrect lack large and diverse corpora that are prerequisite for most possibilities in the AI space. So for many of you, these are issues that don't require much imagination to understand. Anyone who lives their life, including digitally, in more than one language will be familiar with the situation of mangled characters or struggling to find a way to produce the right accent and character when on an unfamiliar computer. But the sorts of people who are likely to attend global digital humanities conferences have a different background, priorities, and goals than the tech company decision makers whose choices underpin the modern digital world. This is me with uh, my, my early computers. Um, you know, on, on one hand, the, the situation for multilingual support in digital environments is much improved from 20 or 30 years ago when the digital landscape was awash in different text encoding standards. In the mid 90s, if you can imagine, it was impossible to make a website with bilingual poetry in any arbitrary combination of languages or writing systems, unless you were using images of the text instead of actual digital text. ASCII, the set of characters needed to write English, was supported across the board, but the other writing systems supported by any particular encoding were shaped by individual languages and cultures. The big five character encoding supporting Chinese characters, along with partial support for Greek, Japanese, Russian, Bulgarian, and some international phonetic alphabet, but not Korean. Windows 1251 covered all the Slavic languages using Cyrillic, but not the Georgian script, or even all the letters used by Central Asian languages that use Cyrillic. Um, the, the Unicode Consortium was founded in 1991 to create and maintain the Unicode standard and the ecosystem of associated data and libraries to support uh, multilingual text exchange. This was not purely or even primarily an altruistic undertaking. Prior to Unicode, it was a time-consuming and expensive undertaking to localize software for different markets, leading to a different versions of Windows and the Office products released at different times with non-trivial code-based differences to accommodate different languages and writing systems, which also meant longer-term hassles around software maintenance. The amount of localization labor could only be justified for relatively high GDP markets. Unicode wasn't the only initiative working on comprehensive encoding for the world's writing systems. In its earliest drafts, it had a less expansive scope, excluding historical scripts in an ultimately failed bid to squeeze all the world's unique characters into a smaller encoding space with file storage ramifications in an era where that was more important. But it was the effort that gained uptake most quickly and thoroughly in Silicon Valley and has become the global standard for character encoding. Unicode is essential standards infrastructure that makes multilingual text exchange or even monolingual text exchange for languages other than English possible, consistent, and reliable. And yet it's almost never taught in the DH curriculum or any other curriculum for that matter. So here's another fact that might surprise you. While there are still writing systems that are not fully supported by Unicode, and there are others whose widespread adoption is hindered by lack of fonts and keyboard layouts, there are, by my estimate, fewer than five people, maybe a lot fewer than five people, across the globe for whom Unicode is their full-time job. So much of this work has been taken up by volunteers during nights and weekends. Anshuman Pandey, perhaps the most prolific writer of proposals to get new scripts accepted into Unicode, is an investment banker by day. 
While some of the people involved with Unicode officially have some small portion of their job at a tech company allocated to this work, it's far from their biggest priority, so it spills over into nights and weekends. Also, amazingly, many of the people who were involved with Unicode in its earliest days still are. It's a close and tight-knit community that has, by and large, worked with each other for a very long time. A new generation of volunteers has joined this community over the last decade, bringing with them greater diversity in backgrounds, languages, and life experiences than the original founders, who demographically skewed the way you'd expect for an initiative founded in Silicon Valley in the 90s. Seeing this group in action is a beautiful thing, and it makes me at least feel a little wistful for the lost possibilities for DH work. How might things look different in the field if more DH projects from the 90s to today had founders with stable, well-paid jobs and actually could be a viable uh, long-term hobby? As, as someone who's had to shut down projects due to major changes in life circumstances, including those that come with university staff jobs, it makes me think. But one consequence for longer-term projects with a small and stable volunteer base is it's easy to accrue documentation debt. When most of the community has a shared collective memory, it exacerbates the national human tendency to put off documentation. Having things probably written down somewhere, which might mean in someone's email from 20 years ago, but knowing that someone can most likely dredge up whatever information is needed from memory or old inboxes, it makes things easier up to a point. The founding generation is hitting retirement age, and at a recent event, one active Unicode member half joked that the core volunteers should never be allowed to travel on the same plane because one plane crash on an international standard is in serious trouble. Which brings me to Silicon, the Stanford Initiative on Language Inclusion and Conservation in Old and New Media. The project began last year under the leadership of three PIs, Tom Mullaney, a historian who's worked on the Chinese typewriter, Elaine Treharn, a medievalist based in the English department, and Catherine Starkey, a German medievalist in my own division of literatures, cultures, and languages. Silicon's goal is to address the needs of digitally disadvantaged languages. What we've found over the nine months of the project so far is that many of the problems in the space are essentially dongle problems. Community members, linguists, technologists, each bringing their own expertise to bear on these problems, but these efforts can be derailed by small challenges. Maybe it's getting access to a historical document with examples of how a character is used. Maybe it's confirming an interpretation of how a script works with a native speaker, but the most fluent speakers are elders who aren't comfortable with Zoom. All it takes is a few well-placed phone calls or maybe a few thousand dollars to fund an in-person visit. But those things can be just outside the bounds of the resources available to people who are most likely doing this work on a volunteer basis. We're planning to help bridge these gaps for a Silicon Fellows program where people engage in this work and apply, be it for a stipend, a travel grant, or access to archival materials, and receive the resources they need to overcome these small but show-stopping hurdles in their work. Recognizing the need for more people with global multilingual perspectives to find their way into decision-making positions in Silicon Valley, we're also developing and starting an internship program with the medium-term goal of cultivating career pathways for these students, particularly ones with a humanistic background. As a way to get started, this summer we'll be hosting three interns through a program where they need to be placed with a nonprofit organization, in this case Unicode, where they'll be collaborating with Andrew Glass, who works on font design and shaping, and Anshuman Pandey, who develops encoding proposals for new scripts and expansions to current scripts. We anticipate having one or two more working with a common locale data repository, a Unicode project creating a giant database with information for each of the world's languages, like how they format dates and numbers and what the words are for common software interface terms like file and open. You'll get to hear more about how those internships are going this summer at the International DH Conference in Washington, DC, or from anywhere in the world via the conference's hybrid arrangement. Beyond the broader dongle problems addressed by the Silicon Fellows program and the concrete contributions and ongoing work by the Silicon interns, we anticipate that one of the greatest contributions we can make to this landscape is asking questions and writing things down. Last week, I got to attend a script ad hoc committee meeting, a group of people who evaluate and decide on the script proposals. Um, the group has long been run by Deborah Anderson from, the U from UC Berkeley, um, with the Script and Coding Initiative. I've known Debbie for over a decade and I'm a huge fan of the work she and her collaborators have done and I've read their proposals and the papers she's written, but actually sitting in on a meeting, even back channeling with a friend who helped explain things, I acutely felt how much I don't know and couldn't quite follow. But 20 years of doing DH also feels like the right training for how to come into a new technical domain and ask the questions that will lead you down the right path to answers, even if the answers you get at first aren't quite what you need. I wrote a lot of things down and I have lots of ideas now for what kind of resource I wish I'd had before I'd attended the meeting. That's something that I can make and share to make it easier for the next person attending their first committee meeting. I'm sure there are people out there for whom the mission and goals of the Unicode Consortium resonate and who would like to volunteer in some capacity. We hope to metaphorically pave the path for others, um, the, the path that others might take to get involved with this work that can have a transformative impact on the long-term viability of small language communities in the digital world. Um, I'm running close on time, so we'll wrap it up there um, and leave time for questions. So thank you.
For what it's worth, Quinn, I had you having five more minutes. Oh, I have five more minutes. All right, I have another paragraph then that I can. Um... <laughs> All right. Um, in that case, to conclude slightly more expansively, um, so can we win the race for against extinction for the majority of the world's digitally disadvantaged languages? I don't know. Realistically, probably not if we approach this as a set of tasks to handle one language at a time. But bringing together people invested in supporting digitally disadvantaged languages and finding the resources to scale up work on these problems feels like one of the most valuable projects I can be working on right now. It's socially engaged activist DH work, perhaps less dramatically than archiving Ukrainian cultural heritage websites during a war or documenting ICE detention centers and the impact of horrifying government immigration policies, but significant nonetheless. Um, I will close with one final thought. I'm not interested in arguing about definitions of DH and whether silicon is in or out by which metrics. What I can say is that what I've done with DH has turned out to be the preparation I've needed to be able to make an impact in socially engaged projects, first with saving Ukrainian cultural heritage online and now with silicon. There are moments doing DH work where it's easy to ask existential questions. Why are we even doing this? What difference is it going to make? And if that's where you're at with your project right now, rest assured that most or maybe all of DH people go through these moments. And the truth is the longest lasting thing about your project may be the knowledge that ends up inside your head that you can't put to use um, quite yet, but that day may come and that's okay too. So thank you. <laughs>